On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, Saving Mr. Banks' director, John Lee Hancock. And screenwriter, Kelly Marcel. I do want to just sit in my shed and write. That's what I'm built to do. I don't want to be in front of a camera. I don't want to get in anybody's way. I just want to put words on paper. That's how I live. In this episode, Kelly Marcel and John Lee Hancock discuss bringing the story behind Disney's classic Mary Poppins to the big screen. There's not much that's been written about PL, um, actually. There really isn't a lot of research about her out there. There's one book and one documentary. There's some stuff in Australia, but you kind of actually, there's some archives, I think, there, but you actually have to go, you went. Um, you have to go there and, and look at them. I just understood her. There's a lot of stuff about her life that is very uh, similar to my life. And so I related to her. Um, and, and it, you know, there, there are just some of those times, I'm sure it happened with John on the blind side, that you just read a character and you just go, I, I know that person and I know how to, to tell them. Um, and tell their story. I, I, I related to her childhood and, and similarly with Walt. Um, and because they had similar things um, that had gone on with them, I, I, just, I just knew how to tell that story. They, those two characters live inside me and I think anybody else that has had to deal with any of those kinds of issues in their life. I think I was really naive. I don't think I ever thought this isn't going to get made. In fact, I didn't, don't think I ever thought about it getting made either. I just wanted to write this story the way that I wanted to write it. I didn't even think, oh, I can't take the songs from a Disney movie and put them in my script, because it's about Mary Poppins, so... <laughs> You know, I, I just never, ever thought about it. And it was only at the end of it, that, and when we were talking about it, that we realized there's only one place that can make this. And they have categorically, on record, said, we will never make a movie about Walt Disney or a movie with Walt Disney in it. And I was like, oh, shit. The fact that the movie got made and made by Disney and they had no objections and, and loved the movie is kind of a miracle. And I wonder what, the, what you would say to the young Kelly Marcel out here who comes up and says, I've got a great idea. It's about the making of Mary Poppins. No, I don't have the rights to any of this. What would you say to her? Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, had I not had that experience, now I would just go, do it, do it, do whatever. But, at that, but, but no, you, I mean, it's impossible. It's a one in a million. It's a one in a million shot, this one. It's crazy that it got made. Crazy. I mean, it was one of those things where when people read Kelly's script, it just affected everyone in such a positive way that it felt like it had a life of its own. And it wasn't your decision to make it or to not make it. You go, this is being made, and I want to be a part of it. First and foremost, the script was so beautifully written that on the page, you drift naturally between um, the two two time periods, 1906 Australia, 1961 Los Angeles, and it's, it's seemingly effortless on the page, and then you have to make it seem that effortless uh, filming it, uh, which is a challenge, but a good challenge, I thought. And um, I thought if, if Kelly can so seamlessly do this on the page, then there has to be a way to capture that. And so we started discussions, and it should be said, I, I wanted Kelly by my side all the time so that I could have these discussions with her, so that I could, I could, come, I could bump up against something and, I, let me, and, and then tell her, here's what I'm thinking, here's where my brain's going, why is this not right? And we would have discussions about it that led to 
answers that we thought were the right ones. And we started looking for, I just attached myself to visual motifs to be able to, to be able almost like time tunnels to go back and forth. And so some of the ways you can do that is you never, you didn't want, you never want to do the, and we zoom into her eyes and now she's a little girl kind of stuff. And so one of the, one of the devices that we used a lot was a framing device. And I said, I always want to see them. I want to see them both younger and older PL through as many windows as possible, because I think that's a framing device that gives you kind of a storybook feel. It is a frame, and a frame around you says, in some ways, this isn't real. You're having to look through something to see something. And um, it's not unlike something, a painting hanging on the wall that's framed. It, it draws your eye to the middle of it. So we use those framing devices as often as possible. And I also relied heavily on the idea that we talked about a lot, which was that the 12-year-old, these, these memories are maybe not exactly how it happened, that this is the memory of a 12, you know, a young girl. And, and those, because of that, she's a somewhat unreliable narrator, even, even with her own memories. And so it afforded you the opportunity to then stylize those things, all the way down to whether you're talking about Aunt Ellie, who looks exactly like Mary Poppins and stands in her dancer's position in the shadow in the door. And I remember, just as an aside, Rachel Griffiths, who beautifully played the role, came in, and that was her very first day of work. And I said, no, you need to stand here, stop here. Your feet have to be pointed exactly like this. And she goes, we're not going for realism here, are we? And I said, no, we're, this is heavily stylized. And she was a little flummoxed. And she goes, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about, because I was talking about the unreliable narrator of it all. And she said, when I was a child, I had an uncle that was so massive, he filled a door. And his name was Uncle Edward. And I remember him being the jolliest, most fun, bigger than life guy I'd ever met in my, you know, in my young years. And then for many, for decades, I didn't see Uncle Edward again. And then when I saw him, he was short and not that funny. She goes, so I preferred to think of him as larger than life. And I said, that's exactly what we're going for. Now, I've brought every newfangled treatment available in Sydney. Close your mouth, Biddy. We are not a codfish. The other thing we were always very careful not to do was use the word flashback. So we didn't actually call them flashbacks. We treated Australia and Los Angeles as their own films. Um, and we shot them that way as well. So you can take each part of that film and they both run as their own little films. We also wanted them to borrow from one another. We es essentially had three different time periods, if you will. 1906 Australia, 1961 Los Angeles, and 1964 Los Angeles, which is essentially the movie itself. And we didn't care. We, made, we, we said, the rules are for this. There are no rules. We will plant stuff that they can steal from each other all the time. You know, we can have something in 1906 Australia that is in the movie Mary Poppins. We can have something from the movie that is in 1961 that comes out of the, out of the mouth of P.L. Travers. We wanted it all to become just this wash of time periods. So John had me in prep on set and post, which um, if you're, you're it's very unlikely to have this experience, but it's magical when you find a director that is like that. And um, this was extraordinary. Um, he, uh, so I would be in just an office down the hallway from his office, and he came in today and he was like, today we're just gonna sit, you and I, we're gonna go into my office and we're just gonna sit and watch Mary Poppins. And I was like, really? Because like, I've seen it so many times <laughs> at this point. And John was like, no, we're gonna do it for a really specific reason. We're gonna go through and we're gonna find things in the film that we can put in our own film. So there are lots and lots of little, nuggets for you to find in Saving Mr. Banks if you really know Mary Poppins well. Stop! 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 What on earth are you talking about? Super Kelly. Super Kelly. Or whatever the infernal thing is. It's something you say when you don't know what to say. Well, I always know what to say. It was an exact line from the movie, and she says exactly what the father says. Mary Poppins taught us the most wonderful words. Super Kelly, Fred, you're listening to me early, don't you? What on earth are you talking about? Super Kelly, <laughs> super, or whatever the infernal thing is. Is that mean to say when you don't know what to say? Yes, well, I always know what to say. For fans of the film, they go, maybe Don DeGrotti was there and thought that was so clever that he wrote it down and it made it into the script. Yeah. And so, therefore, David Tomlinson is now saying it. Yeah. 
for those that don't know, um, PL adopted a, a child, one of two twins. She decided to take one, but not the other. And um, he also, like her father, became an alcoholic later in his life. And he actually died of alcoholism just before we um, started shooting the film. So it was all terribly sad. Um, and so the movie was about how she had, I think it was about how she had somehow passed alcoholism down through the generations, though the child was not biologically hers. Alison Owen brought me that script, which I loved, and, 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 is, and is, a, is a great film, just not the film that we wanted to make. So there's a section in that film where she comes to LA, and Alison and I decided that was, that that was the movie rather than all of the stuff that was surrounding it. That was the balancing act of that script. I mean, that's, that was the hardest thing to do. I, uh, rather than knowing where, I don't outline, or I've, I've just started to, I've given in, given in. But I don't outline, so that's the other thing about that script is it feels like it's really heavily plotted and actually I just sort of let it take me where it wanted to go and let the characters tell me what they wanted to do. So those breaks happen very naturalistically where I felt where I felt they should, you know, I would get to the end of a scene and go, okay, now I need to go to Australia. But what I did was I used a lot of um, similar words. So for example, when Pamela runs out of the hotel, when she sees the pairs in the hotel room and she goes out onto her balcony because she's going to throw them off the balcony, I would use words in the script like, it's hot, it's arid, it's dry, and then start the next section, which would begin in Australia with, it's hot, it's arid, it's dry, so that everything would feel like it was part of the last thing. So. There was a lot of repetitive word usage between Australia and LA to just help us. And then John obviously can't, so John then has to translate that to screen. So he has to show us hot and arid and white heat, I think. And so it does go white and hot in the movie there and then start white and hot in Australia. So, so that's how you make those transitions. There's a three-act structure to the back and forth and what happens, because you can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it's just that, even, you know, even if the transitions are seamless. There was a thing that I read that I'd never read before in a script, and it was daunting to think about how to make this work, because it worked beautifully on the page, which is there comes a time when they are pitching her uh, a song, and she's come to a place with all these memories where they're haunting her, and we are going back and forth between the Sherman Brothers pitching Fidelity Fiduciary Bank and her memories of a childhood fair with their father drunkenly, you know, falling and making an ass of himself. And this weird thing happens in the script that was really challenging, but in, in, at one point Kelly even said, we don't have to make it this challenging. We can cut back and just make it two separate stories and go back and forth. Because the interesting notion that she'd put in was that 1906 was informing 1961, and 1961 was informing her memories of 1906, as the words for Fidelity Fiduciary Bank, which hadn't been written yet, come out of the mouth of her father, who was giving a speech in 1906. And I thought, whoa, that is, that is heavy, great stuff. We've got to be able to try to accomplish this, and I think we did. When you deposit tuppence in a bank account, soon? Soon you'll, you'll see that it blooms into credit of a generous amount, semi-annually, and you'll achieve that sense of stature as your influence expands to the high financial strata that established credit now commands. You can purchase first and second trustees. Think of the foreclosures, bonds, chattels, dividends, shares, 
bankruptcies, debtor sales, opportunities, all manner of private enterprise, enterprise shipyards, shipyards, the mercantile, collieries, tannery, incorporations, amalgamations, banks. I don't think we tried to plant anything intentionally. I think we just always wanted to be aware that we were seeing it through the eyes of a young girl um, and know that these moments in her life that are most probably true, just exaggerated through the, through the eyes of a child, have resulted in making her this, the person that she, this adult that she is. And I, but, I, but I also think there is the point when we let the audience in on the fact that she's not reliable when, you know, her memories of the fair or her father singing Fidelity Fiduciary Bank. So, you know, that's one of those things you go, wow, the, 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 the present is informing the past or is the past informing the present and, and it's all just a mishmash of time travel. And I remember we were shooting the fair and, and, and I had done it, uh, you know, I mean, I think you had said, Maybe you, I can't remember if you said that he sang it or it was, there was something lyrical about the way he was saying it or I can't remember exactly how the script put it. I said, let's make him sing along to this, let's just do it once. Well, and the thing is we had shot all these different wide stuff with him just giving the speech, trying to kind of dose it in a bit of reality because the fear is, oh, it's going to be too much if he breaks into song. We'll have really gone too far in terms of this unreliable narrator. But if he sang the words, then maybe she would have mentioned those words in the rehearsal room and maybe they would have made their way into the song. But then it wasn't until the last two takes and the sun going down that we decided to go, okay, Colin, you up for it? You want to sing it? And he said, sure. And he sang it and that's in the movie. I, I really understood her and I really inhabited her and I understood that not everything that she was saying necessarily meant that she that she felt it she just couldn't help herself she just couldn't help herself she just couldn't open up she's a closed character and she didn't want to make friends with anybody she didn't like america she didn't you know she felt attacked the whole time that she was there and even this sweet little dude that's driving her in a car like for her, he he must have been the most irritating as well because he gets to her and and a lot of her very painful memories, the ones that are about her dad, happen as triggered a lot of the time. First off, by Ralph. Beautiful, ain't it? If you like that sort of thing, I do. I don't know what the intention was, but for me, there's also something the audience comes to find out. Everybody, everybody else who's in the movie is behind and doesn't know, and then Tom Hanks, as Walt Disney, discovers the thing that we already knew. Yeah. So it's a great game of catch-up. Um, and the thing that he finds out that we know all along is this grumpy Londoner, you know, who's very cityfied and all dressed to the nines, was a little farm girl. From Australia. From Australia. Yeah. So you, you get to see that, and you get the juxtaposition of that little girl riding backwards on a horse, bareback, and then, then she's in a limousine, and, 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 you know, and we come to marry those two ideas as part of the same person. So having said we treated the script like the Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> this actually had dialogue in it, and it was one of the lines that we'd taken from the film and put into the script, so she said, I can't remember what Ginty said to her, but she said sometimes the person, a person we love can't see beyond the end of their nose, which is a line from Mary Poppins. But we realized, and, and it was Ruth, I think, was so emotional in that scene that she, she wasn't, there was no ability for her to get a line out there. She's like, the, the scene leading up to it is very, very emotional. She's basically just said to her child, I know you gave him a bottle of booze, and now I'm off. And then walks into the river. I know you gave it to you. Take it. 
care of your sisters. Oh. I know you love your father more. But one day, you will understand. I've been in Alara and I've walked from their house to that river and just thinking, you know, of her and walking down that and it's not that far and it's not that deep and you go, you have to really want to die to make this, this walk. Um, and so that's what was an important scene for me. There were some people that had said early on, I don't know, it's a little dark and it goes to a place, do you really need it? And I said, I just, I just have to have it in there. Well, and Ruth felt it very strongly for her character. She felt very strongly that the only words she wanted to say were, I'm sorry. And she's that character, you know, you, when you've finished with the script and you give it to the actor, it's theirs. And if someone's telling you very passionately that they believe something, then, then you have to listen. We needed a scene where she was happy. We needed a scene where she was actually enjoying herself for once. You have to take her to that place to then bring her world crashing down around her. And we, and we when we designed, because that's, we built that on stage, the rehearsal room, even though it's, you know, you look outside, it looks exactly like old animation at Disney Studios, and it's in keeping with the architecture. But the design, the, the, what I, we had talked about, we had in mind was, when she says yes to the dance, I wanted to see her foot cross over, and so we did this rehearsal room with a dance floor and then other flooring, so that we could actually see her make that decision. And so her foot on a swell crosses over, and it is one of those moments where you go, oh, she's in, she's crossed over, she's saying yes. From a com composer standpoint, Thomas Newman, they're actually playing it in the room, and then we use Dolly going down the hall to go to Walt Disney's office, to bring in the orchestra swell and to do something that's actually not being played in the room, but they continue to play in the room. So it was an excuse to then bring the full orchestra in to play the, play the song. It's just she's, she's dancing. Mrs. Travers, she's dancing with Dawn. Oh. It's funny because when you, we would screen the movie in London, they would side with Travers. You could feel it. They'd go, how did she put up with that overstuffed, you know, blowhard Walt Disney? And then in, in America, they would say, how did Walt Disney, dear Walt, put up with this, with this insane woman? So there's a little bit of both. But, but back to that scene for a second. You talk about the humor at the end of it. Kelly did a very, very clever thing at the end. When she finishes, and we're all swept up along with, she's singing, she, oh, I love it, he fixes the, he mends the kite, I love it, and all that. And then, just, just because you don't want it to be all rosy, she has a line. Although the proper English would be, let us go and fly a kite. As, let us go and fly a kite. I might be willing to overlook that. The male-female reaction to the movie was everybody really loved the movie, but the male response was usually uh, she might be five percent too arch. You might want to back off her just a little bit. And I they wanted her more likable. Yeah, yeah, they wanted her to be more likable because she scared them, in a way. <laughs> and and it was funny because it, and then, and then I remember uh, Aileen McKenna saw it. And she, and she heard them and she goes, don't you dare, I will kill you. Yeah. She, goes, she is perfect. She goes, you love her so much by the end, why not make it harder at the start? It's yeah. a better journey. And I said, eh, you're right, you're right. You've been watching a conversation with Kelly Marcel and John Lee Hancock on On Story.
OnStory is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's OnStory project, including the OnStory PBS series, now streaming online, the OnStory radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the OnStory book series available on Amazon. To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.